everybody, this is Robin here from Nest Soapery, and today I thought it would be really fun to do a Q&A session. A couple of weeks ago, I put a post up on my stories and Instagram and asked you guys to submit some questions so that I could answer them for you. And I got a ton of questions. So I'm going to answer probably about 15 of them here today. And if you have any questions that you would like me to answer in a future Q&A video, please comment down below with what you want to know about me, about my business, or about what I'm going to be doing moving forward. Now, one of the first questions that I got was how I edit my videos. Now, believe it or not, I do not use any special video taping equipment. I use my phone. I have a Pixel 4a, so it's not even really the best phone out there. And you can probably tell, it's I don't produce the highest quality videos, but they're pretty good. Um, so I record everything on my phone, and if it's soap making, I have my phone on a clamp above my soap making station. Um, and if it's like right now, you are currently on my phone in a clamp in front of me. Um, and then I pull all of my video into an app called UCut. It's available on mobile for free. You can also get an upgrade, but I just haven't seen the need for it just yet. And I edit everything within UCut, and then I will export it and upload it to either Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube, depending on what platform I'm going to be using. Now, that's just the broad strokes. Obviously, there's a whole lot more to editing than just bring it into an app and edit it and then upload it, right? But I'm going to put a video together for you guys so that you can see how I work my process of creating a reel on Instagram. Um, I've been working on it for a while. <sighs> the thing is, it's all done like on my phone and it's hard to give you guys very, very clear instructions on how to do it. So I'm still trying to figure out how to make it really nice and easy for you. Uh, the next question was actually about my tattoos. So Abra at Lustration Soaps wants to know about this tattoo here. She says, is it a cupcake with angel wings? Sort of. So I have a cupcake here tattooed onto my chest because when I was in art school, I decided to go to pastry school afterwards and become a pastry chef. But I also wanted to do something to celebrate my grandmother who had passed away in 2002. And so, and she was very, very Catholic. So there were like sacred hearts all over the place. Um, and I remember even at her funeral, getting one of the funeral cards of, uh, I think it was Mary with the sacred heart in front of her. So I've always thought about my grandmother and the sacred heart in the same sentence. And so when I was about to leave for pastry school, I went to my tattoo artist, whose name is Matt Lukesh. He's actually located in Iowa City now. Um, and I was like, all right, man, I need, a, I need a cupcake, but I need it to be badass. How are we gonna do this? And he designed this tattoo of a cupcake with a crown, instead of a crown of thorns, it's got a crown of lemon peel. And in, instead of a flame, it's got frosting and it's got a cherry on top. And of course, wings, right? But they're not angel wings, they're bat wings because bat wings are way cooler. And also like he he's a huge person. He likes to work with color quite a bit. Um, and I do need to get my tattoo touched up so I can't really like exhibit how great the color was when I first got it. I'll put a picture up of what it looked like. Um, and yeah, that's my tattoo. That's the reason why. It's my sacrilegious tribute to my grandmother and also subtle nod to pastry school. Okay, I got a question about soda ash. How do I avoid soda ash? I do this in a couple of ways. First, I use a pretty severe water discount, which was actually another question that was asked about my water discount. When I'm mixing my lye solution, I always use a ratio of 1 to 1.5. So one part lye, 1.5 parts water. It's a pretty severe water discount. Um, and so that can help prevent soda ash. But also after I've made my soaps, as long as it's a flat top, I like to put a top on top of it. <laughs> my molds come with wooden tops that go over the top of it. And that reduces the head space. Um, the head space is the space between the top of the soap and the top of the container. So if you put a top on top of that, 
I'm saying top way too many times now. You can reduce that headspace, which means that less oxygen is able and less other free gases are able to get to the top of your soap. There are still some times where I will get soda ash and if that happens, I can steam it. Um, if it's a flat top, I'll just go ahead and plane it because I don't really need anything fancy on top there. Um, and it's sometimes just completely unavoidable. Sometimes you just need to embrace it. Handmade soap is made by hand. It's gonna look like it. All right, I did get a question about canola oil. Now, I feel like canola oil has a stigma attached to it. Like, ooh, that's like cheap oil. <laughs> and it is. It's really, really, really affordable. The reason I chose to use canola oil though is because it gives you a really fluid batter. And I like to work with my batter being very, very fluid so that I can have complex designs and I have a lot of time to work with it. The only problem with it is that when I'm doing a design where I have to thicken up my soap, where it has to be at least at a, a light or a medium trace before I can start pouring, I have to blend that sucker like crazy. So if you have my standard soap recipe, I'll put a link for it down in the description box below, um, and it, that one does use canola oil. If you're having troubles with it thickening up, just blend it like mad. It can take it like a couple of minutes at least of blending um, and it's not going to just seize up on you. I can't guarantee that your fragrance oil won't do that, but the soap recipe itself will not thicken up very quickly. Then I got a question about which scents I avoid using. <laughs> and I can tell you with 100% certainty that I avoid 100% floral scents. So floral scents within the soap making realm are notorious for seizing up batter, like soap on a stick situations. I'm not about that life, so I avoid floral soaps. The other reason I don't really like floral soaps is that they can be very, very strong um, and can give me a headache pretty easily. And as the soap maker, I'm gonna be sitting around with this soap on my curing rack in my, <laughs> in my space for quite a while. So I wanna not hate the soap that I made. You know, everybody likes something different. And I understand that there are certain people who really, really like fragrance, certain people who really like floral fragrance soaps. And I do use some fragrances that have floral notes in them. Um, it's just not, not as often as, you know, using another kind of fragrance, one that behaves well within soap. One person asked how my goal with soap has changed now that my soaps are getting traction. And it's a, it's a really good question. It's something that I've been thinking about for several months now, actually. If you follow me on Instagram, you know I have almost 20,000 followers. Probably by the time I'm posting this, I have over 20,000 followers on Instagram. And that's nothing to sneeze at, right? That's a pretty good amount of followers. But what I've noticed is probably 90% of my followers are also soap makers. And so having a ton of followers does not equal a ton of sales. That's actually the answer to this question here. What's the, the biggest lesson that I learned? The biggest lesson that I learned was that followers do not equal sales. You might be following soap makers who have more followers than I do, who do worse sales than I do. And I'm just gonna be real with you guys, like physical products have not sold well for my shop. And I don't think it's because my soap is bad. I think it's because most of my followers are soap makers. And I have, I have repeat customers. I've got folks who have been ordering from me for the last year and don't plan on stopping anytime soon. But you know, as a soap, <laughs> As a business owner, when you're selling a product, when somebody doesn't buy your product, it really has nothing to do with the fact that your product is good or bad. It really just means that they're not compelled to buy your product. So really what I need to do is start stringing along a really great story for why my product is worth buying. Or I go in another direction. And that's where I, that's where I'm going, you guys. I love making soap. I'm not gonna stop making soap. I love making other products. I'm not gonna stop making other products, but my new focus is to provide soap makers with recipes and resources and cool tools. Guys, I am obsessed with spreadsheets and tracking and doing everything I can to optimize my productivity, 
to be the most efficient person I can be. And I know that those tools will be useful for you guys as well. So I'm working on a whole host of tools that you guys as soap makers or just product makers can use to make yourselves more efficient, more productive, or just more organized. And who doesn't want to be more organized, right? One person asks, are handmade soaps always more soft than commercial made soaps? I'm gonna say no, not always, right? Most of the time, yeah. Handmade soaps are actually made from raw ingredients and some makers may not cure for as long as other makers do. Some makers will use ingredients that will create a softer bar and some makers will use ingredients that create a harder bar. You might find that the bar made from the person at your farmer's market, you know, they use tallow and lard and palm oil. Their bars might be hard as a rock, right? But then you go over to the vegan soap maker, they're not using lard or tallow, and maybe they have a palm-free recipe and their soaps might be a little bit softer. It's just a matter of what you value in a bar of soap. Do you want it to be hard but you're willing to use animal products? Do you want it to be hard and you're willing to use palm products? Or are you okay with it being a little bit softer, being used a little bit faster, and you're only using products that are plant-based? It's completely up to you and there's no wrong decision. There's a, there's a soap maker out there for everyone, okay? I make palm-free vegan soaps, but not everybody likes that and that's okay. Someone asked how I formulate soaps or how I formulate my recipes, my products. Usually for me, it starts with an idea. Oh, I love micellar water. I buy a lot of micellar water. Maybe I can make my own micellar water. And then it's a, let me scan all of the ingredients that are on micellar water. Let me try feeling exactly what it feels like in my hand. Let me get a little vial of it here and I'll place it next to what I create so that I can compare side by side. And then I go online and I'm looking for recipes. Does anybody make micellar water? What exactly is micellar water? Is it just water? Guys, I asked myself this question for a really long time. Like, what the heck is micellar water? What is in, what is a micelle? Well, I find out a micelle is a ball that contains oil. And within your body, your body creates micelles from the fats that you eat and circulates it through the lymphatic system to your liver, where it then can be digested and then sent through the bloodstream for all of your cells to use. Okay, so a micelle is like a little ball of nutrition or a little ball of um, fat, right? But within micellar water, it's actually these tiny little balls that are meant to whisk away dirt, whisk away fat, whisk away, not fat, but like oils and sweat from your face or from whatever surface you're using them with. And the other hang up with micellar water is that it has to be something that can be left on the skin. It does not need to be rinsed, right? It's just micellar water. So looking up what kind of perfectly clear surfactants can I use that can be left on the skin in a diluted form, right? And then figuring out what's the maximum usage for each of these individual ingredients. And which ingredients do I need? Which preservative do I need? Because this is mostly water, right? So we need to add a preservative to this product. And so it's a whole lot of like, okay, I'm gonna go down that rabbit hole. What can I find online about my cellar water, about these ingredients? Let me go ahead and put it all together in a tiny little batch, compare it with my original vial, wash this half with the original my cellar water, and wash this half with mine. Give it to my friends after I've determined that it's not dangerous to use. Ask them to try it out. So it's, it's a long process to develop a new recipe. And then I usually test it out for a couple of months personally before I ever release it to anyone. Somebody asks how I calculate price. I'm not gonna get fully into this process here in the video, but what I will say is that I have a spreadsheet that I've created where I input all of the products that I purchase and exactly how much it costs at the bulk price that I use. And then I determine how many ounces come in that full shipment. And then that will give me how much it is per ounce. Then I have a separate sheet within the same Excel document where I'm able to put in all of my ingredients and choose certain ones from a drop-down menu. 
and it automatically calculates the price per bar, um, depending on how many bars you're making in one batch. And so that will give you a really good idea of what it costs for you to make each individual bar. Then you have to multiply by however many times you want to for your margin or add your labor cost to it. So let's say, hypothetically, it costs you $10 to produce a batch of soap, but it took you three hours. That's a, that's a lot of time. It took you three hours to make a batch of soap. And let's say minimum wage is 15 bucks, right? So let's say all together, your bars of soap cost $5.50 a piece because all together it's $55 for the full batch and you're producing 10 bars. So if that's the case, then you know that you wanna get at least $5.50 per bar and then you wanna add something else onto it for your packaging or for um, advertising online or any other costs that you need to include into it or shipping or if you're doing free shipping or something like that. So then you have to decide what other, you know, things you wanna add into the cost of the bar. In general, my rule of thumb is about $2 per ounce of soap. Um, and that's generally what I'm gonna stick with, I think. Somebody asked, how did I grow so fast on Instagram? And it really was a really quick journey. In January of 2021, I started on Instagram and now it is almost May. It's May of 2022 and I'm at 20,000 followers. It's been a fast growth. There's a lot of steps that go into growing your social media very quickly and just growing in general, to be honest, but I'm gonna be totally frank with you. It's a lot of work. You have to put in the time. You have to be consistent. You have to be creating content that people want to see. So it's a matter of having good photography, of posting at the right time, of engaging with the right community and of having meaningful connections, meaningful conversations with people, sliding into the DMs of your favorite soap makers or just ones that you feel are your contemporaries, people who do the same style of soap making that you do. So I really do encourage you to get out there and just start talking to people, build your community, build your tribe. You're gonna find the right little group of soap makers for you to help you inspire yourself and uh, feel motivated to keep on going because just like any other industry, just like any other business, the soap making business, the soap making world is tough. If you guys are interested in how I grew so quickly on Instagram, please do subscribe because I'm gonna be releasing a series of short videos, pretty short. This one's way longer <laughs> than it will be in the future. Um, but I'm gonna be creating some really short videos with quick tidbits of tips that you can use for your social media, for Instagram in particular, to grow. Um, and then I'm also going to be releasing a product that you can use to track your growth, your engagement, and see what really works for you and your followers. That's key. Last question today is, what is my favorite design or scent that I've ever used? And I'm gonna actually split this up into two, okay? So my favorite design that I've ever used would be the nesting drop. This is my own personal creation and I really do need to do more of it. I just, I need to get back into making some soap. It's been a rough go trying to get back into the swing of things after uh, Remy died. But anyway, that's my favorite design, this nesting drop. It looks awesome, it's super cool, it's really, really versatile. And there's been a lot of people who have been using this design technique to create some really incredible and really dynamic soap bars. As far as scent goes, oh, you guys. Moss and black coral from Candle Science. I have said it before, I will say it again. It is the sexiest scent I have ever smelled. My husband is not allowed to use any other soap. I'm not using any other soap. It smells so good. It behaves really well in soap as well. Uh, I get it from Candle Science. I will put a link in the description box below so that you can check out their website. It's phenomenal. You will not regret it. All right, you guys, that's the end of the Q&A for today. If you have more questions, please do put them down in the description box below. I'd be happy to address them in a future Q&A session. I hope you all are doing well out there and I will see you in the next video. Until then, be well.